response to the call of God, we have come to worship. We are surrounded by believers throughout the world who name Jesus as their Savior and Messiah. In response to the love of God, we come to hear the good news again. We are surrounded by God's loving people, bound together in community of the Holy Spirit can create. We confess our broken community. God, We are one in God's new community. We are one in body and spirit. Praise God for forgiveness. Amen. The reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Is not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message to pre preach to those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Well, good morning, boys and girls. You know, we heard some words this morning from Jesus' friend and disciple, Paul. And um, they, were, they were words that sometimes confuse little people, but basically what it meant was that God can take something simple and small and with his power make it great. How many of you believe that? Yeah, me too. I'm all about that. Yeah. So this morning, I want you to help me tell a story about a man, a young boy called Amal. Of a different name. Do any of you have friends named Amal? No. A very different name. And you know why? Because Amal was born way across the ocean in the area where Jesus was born. Whole other world, way across the world. So I would like somebody to volunteer to come up here and meet Amal. And since we have such a nice. Could you come up? That was such a good volunteer. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to pretend that our friend. Daniel is Amal, okay? Now, let me tell you a little bit about Amal. Amal had um, lived in this country, and he, what was it? I can really love it. <laughs> Amal lived in a, in a, in a um, really backwoods area, kind of a country, rural, they call it, area. Not kind of like Palm City, but um, in the country. And he and his mom are very poor. Cool. They did not have any money, absolutely not. The only thing they had were a few animals, and um, his very favorite animal was his lamb. And you know what, boys and girls? He had to sell the lamb just so they could put food on the table. That's, that's pretty sad, isn't it? So away went the lamb, and also our friend Maul had one other challenge in life. He had a leg that just didn't work, and he had to use a crutch. What you're going to do, that's it. He had one crutch, and this is what he did. He used this one crutch, and he would get around in it. Can you try walking with that? It's kind of hard, isn't it? It's not so, it's not so easy. What are some of the things that would be hard for a mall to do if he was had a crutch and a leg that was really giving him a lot of trouble? Tell me something. Be, yeah, it might be hard for him to swim. Anything else you think might be hard for him to do? Walk, yeah, and, and how about running? You know, kids like to, how many of you guys like to run outside? Sure, how 
don't even like to climb things. Sure. And it was tough for a mom. Can you walk back over here for me? Oh, it was a really, really tough life for a mom. Well, one night, the not even the day you showed up. I want to see if you can guess who they are. I need three volunteers. <laughs> Jesus, on the night when she was betrayed, took bread. When he gave him thanks, he 
broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And ever since then, people have gathered together in homes around tables to celebrate the real presence of Jesus in bread and wine. Before we come, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sure, uh, get in front in the center before I start talking and all that stuff. 
that I fail to make that connection with God. And, and that, it's kind of that thought of doing routine things and never really stopping to connect emotionally and spiritually with God that inspired the, service, the sermon series that I'm doing for Lent, which is called The God Questions. Uh, we've got some people visiting today, so I'm going to just kind of help bring you up to speed on what we've been doing. But what we've been doing is asking God some of those serious questions. Have you ever said to yourself, I can't wait to get to heaven and ask God about that one? <laughs> I say, it seems like I say that all the time. So I thought, well, let's ask the questions and see what we can do. And we've been utilizing what God's given us to try to find the answers. God's given us his words, so we use the scriptures. He's given us intelligent people who have studied the word, we use them. We use all of our knowledge of how the world works, combined with our life experiences, to see if we can come up with some fairly true and faithful answers to some of the big questions in life. The first week, two weeks ago from today, we asked the question, I'm not, there it is. Uh, we asked God, what's up with the weather? I mean, if you've ever had some event that you were going to do outside rained out, or if you've ever found yourself lying in a bathtub waiting for a hurricane to pass, you know what I'm talking about. And I never wondered, God, why did you make it rain on my daughter's outside wedding? I mean, are they not supposed to get married? Or, or what, what, does, what does that mean? What, what, I mean, what's up? I mean, why did you send three hurricanes the same place two years in a row? I mean, we were doing something wrong? Or how about, did you send Hurricane Katrina to New Orleans because you don't like transvestites? <laughs> you know, what's up with this? And you, you know, or my favorite question I used to ask that's when I was a pastor up in Pennsylvania was, why do you make it snow on Saturday night <laughs> when no one's going to come to church tomorrow? I mean, they can work with me a little bit on this one. <laughs> but the answer we came up with was, in the Old Testament, God seemed to use the weather to manipulate his people. But once Jesus came, that, that stopped. And Jesus, uh, God seemed to just say, you know, I created the world. And I created weather, and 90% of the time the weather is wonderful. I mean, you may not like it, you may think it's too wet or too dry or too hot, but basically the weather is really good. I'm very proud of the work I did on that one. But sometimes, to make it work to where it's beautiful every once in a while, it will disrupt, it will cause storms. And the assurance that you have is that I did not send the storm, it's just part of how things happen, but I'm with you when you go through the storm. That was the first week. Last week we asked the question, what do I have to give up exactly to be a good Christian? We asked the question, we answered it, we asked another question, we answered that. I don't remember, but we asked the question, what do I have to give up to be a good Christian? Nothing. Remember that? Nothing, because Jesus Christ died in our place to save us from ourselves. But then we ask the second question, what might I be willing to give up for God? And the answer to that one was everything. What do I have to give up? Nothing. What should I be ready to give up? Everything. Okay, now you're up to speed, and today's question is, why don't I fit in? If you ever as a Christian living out your faith, felt like you were out of step with the rest of the world, like you just didn't fit in? If you haven't asked that question, you might ask yourself, why? <laughs> because Jesus came, and Jesus came to change the world and turn it upside down. It's like Jesus came to create a Christian counterculture. He came to take that which it was accepted and change it to something else. And so, we need to be different. Here's a real life, real life example about not fitting in. There's this woman, her name was Lynn. She was newlywed, and she was so excited about being married, but she found out it didn't go so well at work. This is what she said. She said, I knew I needed to stop talking about Greg, but oh, I'm a new bride, and I just couldn't. I was fresh and new. I could be found gushing about my amazing husband any time of the day. But in my work environment, I quickly realized that being happy and being married 
wasn't all that popular. The positive comments I made about, about my husband stood out from the daily husband bashing that all my peers were doing. So it didn't take me long to figure out that if I would dig really deep and find something to complain about, I fit in better. So I started doing that, but always tore at my heart because I knew better. It wasn't a matter of simply letting something slip because I was choosing to be someone I was not. See, Lynn didn't fit in. She tried, but it didn't work. And in the end, she realized she didn't want to. So if you, as a Christian, living out your faith, sometimes feel like you don't belong, it's because you're not supposed to. We're going to look a little bit at what Jesus had to say. But first of all, let's, let's step back to the Old Testament. You may remember the story about uh, this, this egomaniac king. He was just pompous as he could be, and he demanded that everyone in his kingdom bow down and worship him. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. But there happened to be three people in the land that refused to do so. They didn't care if they didn't fit in, and they stood up against it. And so their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused to bow down to the king and said, you bow or you're going to burn. They said, we don't care. So Nebuchadnezzar had them turn the furnace up on the fire, the fire, fire up on the furnace, seven times higher than it had ever been before, and threw them in. A little while later, he went back to check to make sure they were being properly incinerated. He looked in and he saw four people, one, two, three, but one was dressed a little bit differently, and they were standing in the middle of this fire, not burning up, but actually looking quite cool and calm. After he realized the shock, he had them come out of the furnace, and he realized that, that was God, because only three came out, and he declared an edict to all of the country that all of the nation would give up any other god and worship Yahweh, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't fit in. And why didn't they fit in? Because you're not supposed to. Now let's look a little bit at the teaching of Jesus. And I remember what Jesus said about anger. He said, you've heard it said uh, that of ancient times you shall not murder but whoever, and whoever murders will be allowed to judge he said. But I say to you that if you are angry with your brother and sister, and if you insult a brother and sister, and you'll be liable to the council, and if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Huh, now imagine this. Two guys are standing around, they're having a good time talking, and they edge towards politics. And it just so happens that one of them is a Republican and one of them is a Democrat. And it starts off very innocuous, very calm and cool and collected, until they start talking about things that they heard and things that they read, and it gets louder and louder, and it starts to build, and it starts to build, and it gets louder and louder and louder, until they are actually assassinating one another's characters. They're just totally, I mean, somebody came up and said, you guys are killing each other. And one said, we're not killing each other. The other one said, yeah. And that's like, what's going on? And they said, but remember what Jesus said? You are killing each other. Well, that peacemaker didn't fit in. Why? Because you're not supposed to. Remember what Jesus said about adultery? He said, you've heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I tell you that any of you who look at a member of the opposite sex would Lust in your eyes, you have committed adultery? Or what about when he said, uh, and he, he said, uh, you've, heard, you've heard it said to show, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hmm, you ever try doing that? When you do, people will wonder what's wrong with you. Why aren't you retaliating? Why aren't you giving back? You have an eye for an eye, two for two. Says the right there in the Bible. You're not doing that. It's because of what Jesus said. Because we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So once again, why don't you fit in? Because 
you're not supposed to. Something else Jesus said. He said, whenever you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners and do all their prayers. I tell you, they receive their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and your Father, who is in secret, will reward you. I was totally surprised when I started studying this sermon that half of the people that felt alienated, half the Christians that felt alienated, felt alienated at church. That's where they felt the most criticism. And a lot of them said over and over again, the people at church seemed harsh, unfeeling, self-righteous, unforgiving, and defensive. Defensive. And then their argument becomes intolerant of others who have not attained their level of agility in living in the Christian faith. One woman wrote in her blog, she said, this is, this is really challenging for me, she said, because I get it, I'm, I'm Christian. And I accept that Jesus' sacrifice paid my debt. And I strive to follow him, not just as my Savior, but as my Lord, the best that I possibly can. But I can't but help but be ashamed, for some of, our, some of us Christians act toward people who disagree with us, myself included. She said, a couple weeks ago, I, I was writing a blog, and I posted about some um, different ways of preventing sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancy besides abstinence. And you would not believe the response I got, not from the outside world, but from my brothers and sisters. They threw more things at me, a slew of things. She said, multiple people accused me of not being a Christian. One guy even said, my post was from Satan himself. And another guy actually sexually harassed me by, harassed me by saying, I just wanted to create some form of uh, my own perverse pleasure. She went on to write these comments, they're not exactly in tune with our Savior Jesus Christ who one day had a woman brought before him naked. She'd just been caught in the act of adultery. And instead of coming and condemning her, he looked down to her, held out his hand, helped her up, and said, Go and sin no more. It's a big danger that we have as the people of God to become judgmental. Most of us don't hear, hear a name of mine like that. I, we never want this. This, this is a post-it note somewhere. Someone found it said, some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mistake. <laughs> Heaven be forbid that we would ever be like that. So whenever you feel like you don't fit in, the reason is, say it with me, because you're not supposed to. St. Paul put it very eloquently in the reading from Corinthians that Judy read to us earlier. And we're going to, I want to read it again. I want you to help me read it. And we're going to look at it from a different translation. It's a modern paraphrase. Uh, it's called the message. And I'm going to divide it between ones and twos. Okay? And we're going to read it and just kind of we'll take it slow and yet with enthusiasm and see what Jesus is saying about not fitting in. Paul writes, should we go? The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness that the bent on his church. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. It is written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So, where can we find someone who is truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent, this day and age, hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered dumb, preaching of all things to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ the crucified. 
Some treat this like an anti-miracle, and the Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. God's call us to be different. And sometimes you're going to find you don't fit in. But why? Because you're not supposed to. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving us the gift of life and the gift of love. And we ask that you would watch over all those people that you've created in the world who are with us and those who have gone on before us. Oh God, we ask you to give your life giving breath to those who are without, those who don't have what they need to survive, and fill us with an understanding and a sensitivity to those who don't have. We are so blessed, oh God, because you have watch over us, you've given us love, you've given us family, you've given us a great land in which to live, you've given us So please watch over those who need your care. We ask you to be with you every day. Darlene and Louise with Pat and Cleo. Be with Jim and Nick. Be with Donnie. Be with Beverly and Wilbur. Watch over Denny. We ask for human presence. Be with Bill. Be with Todd. And watch over Susan. Be with Greg and with Tim. We ask your continued presence upon Charlotte and Kenneth. Be with Tom and Karen, with Michelle. Continue to strengthen Judy. Watch over Cindy and Janice and Helen. Be with Patsy and Jeff. Send your healing to Carol and James. Be with Kelly and Karen. Scott and Kelly. Be with Lori, Steve, Ryan. Be with Eric, God, Kristen, with Rita and Joe. Be with Kara, John, with Annette, and Kara. Send your healing to Brenda, and Sheila, and all those who need your care. Thanks for loving us. And let us go out and share that love.